Okay, today we have on the show Dr. Rob Carter. Good morning and welcome to the show, Dr. Carter. Good morning. I think the first, we'll start off with a wild card question. Why in the world would you make green fish? <laughs> uh, because they were there. Okay. So, no, because so the, the possibility was there. <laughs> exactly. I was working on uh, fluorescent uh, colors in corals and I figured out there were proteins and then someone said, hey, you got to go talk to this guy in the building across the way because he has these green fish. So I went and talked to him and I said, hey, I've got these corals that are red and green and blue and white. And he was like all excited. And so we wrote a, a proposal through the University of Miami and we said, hey, we think we can grab other colors. Other people just have green and they take two years and we think we can do it in 24 hours. Wow. And we did. We wow. did. We developed a new technique and um, we cloned a lot of coral genes. We put them in bacteria, made the bacteria red and green and orange, and then we put them in fish. In and the made same them way that hemoglobin is red, uh, these, these coral have genes that are green, that kind of idea? It's actually the opposite. Really? Hemoglobin is red because it absorbs everything but red. Ah. The fluorescent proteins have a color because they absorb light at one color, transform it, and release it at another color. Does that, does that change the way the light is uh, uh, sent out? Does it make it more brighter? Does it make it uh, more sharper? Or uh, does it affect the transmission of the light in some way? Yes to those questions. But even after studying this for six or eight years, I still never figured out what the corals are using these things for. Oh, what kind Just, of I don't know it? what what the biological role is of these very important proteins that they make a lot of but i was able to grab them and use them in genetic engineering so well that maybe that could be your second question when you meet the creator <laughs> after a million years i might get my face up off the ground um oh, I, and maybe oh, look I have, around but i absolutely agree you know in the intro i i mentioned that you got your phd from the university of miami in marine biology obviously you're yeah. a geneticist how, how does a guy go from being a swim team coach to being a geneticist? How did you, can you tell us about how you got started in science? I was a high school teacher and I was loving it. And the, um, the parents association put a, a saltwater aquarium in my biology classroom. And I put corals in there and, and some fish and I started asking questions. And after a while I realized that no one knows the answer to these questions. I said, Oh, I think I want to go study coral reef ecology and get a PhD in it. And so I did. That's how I went from point A to point B. Coral reef who? Ecology. Oh, ecology. I'm sorry. I thought you said something else. I'm sorry. I misunderstood. That's right. Okay. These days, it seems that I come across a lot of Christians who see science as the enemy. And uh, the, the question I'd like to ask you is, do you recommend that Christians who are considering a field in science, who are curious about the natural world, would you recommend that they pursue science as a occasion? It's a hard thing. Mm. What I generally tell young people is go for it. Mm. Just go as far and as fast as you can and do the best you can and see what doors open up because you have no idea what doors might open up in front of you or what doors might get slammed in front of you if they find out that you're a Christian or if they find out that you don't believe in evolution. Yeah. But just go for it anyway. The problem is that a lot of very well-meaning young people, you know, they think they're Christians. They get off into the highly secularized uh, environment at a university and everything they thought was true just crumbles. You know, and some I hate to make, see it. Yeah. Yeah. Some ways you're making me think about that painting uh, by Titian, the school of Athens where it shows Plato pointing up and Aristotle pointing out where, how, how do you see up when you spend all your time looking down? If you spend all your time using methodological naturalism and all your time studying the natural world, why would you think that would say anything about the supernatural or anything beyond creation? That, that part always mystified me. Why somebody who's never studied philosophy or theology thinks they're qualified to write books on the topic. And let's just say there's several people who have written a lot of bestsellers it is, it is amazing that people don't understand that science is philosophy. Mm. I mean, uh, I have a PhD. I have a doctorate in philosophy. <laughs> and then you have to ask the question, okay, what philosophy is my scientific training in? And it's the philosophy of naturalism. Mm. Yeah. It's the belief, the assumption that nature is all there is. And, so sciences, they just exclude God right from the very beginning. And that's a 
what a grand assumption that is. Yeah, you proceed from empiricism and then you, 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 you start by saying all you can know is what you learn through your senses. And then you say, well, what about things aren't direct, directly detectable by your senses? And they say, they wave their hands and say, that's ruled out. That's not scientia. That's not knowledge. That, that's opinion. And science is about things. It's as if they're saying, we're from Missouri, show it to me. And if you can't show uh, an infinite uh, immaterial being, then it, he cannot exist. As if, as, you know, I'm sure you've heard the analogy of, uh, I think it was Arthur Eddington gave uh, the analogy of fishing for, to find out what's in the very, very deep sea and using a net with a three inch mesh and discovering that there are only creatures larger than three inches in the deep ocean. <laughs> uh, it's the same idea. And uh, that is, if, if you put your blinders on yourself, you will not see left and right. You will only see in front of you. And that's basically what their restrictions of the methodology leads to. It's yeah. fine if that's all you want to study, but why would you make pronouncements on the part you're, you can't see when you're only looking this way? So I find that very frustrating as I read the books. And that is a very interesting question to ask. How much can we know mm. using empiricism? Mm. We, I mean, we learned how to build buildings and send rocket ships to space and, and make amazing computers. But does that really tell us about origins? No. So at CMI, Creation Ministries, uh, and a lot of written about uh, this on creation.com, is the issue of operational versus origin science mm. or operational versus historical science. That is... What can you actually know through physics and engineering and testing today? Right. And what does that mean about the past? Those are two very different things. Hmm. And so the evolutionary methodological naturalists, they do all this experimenting and they assume that all of that can explain everything that's ever happened in the universe. Isn't it interesting that in the, in the physics world, the guys who write the books, Stephen Hawking, uh, Lawrence Krauss, et cetera, are theoretical physicists. And the experimental physics, uh, physicists, the ones who get down in the dirt and have to design tests in order to test the theories, uh, they get the results, but they don't, they don't write the books and they don't become famous. In other words, it's the guys who are using flights of fancy and imagination, write books and then make pronouncements about the existence or non-existence of God. The guys who test have a different opinion. Carl Sagan, mm. Richard Dawkins, mm -hmm. Charles Darwin. Those are all made in the same mold. Yeah. People that can tell a good yarn, but the experimental foundation for all three of those men really wasn't there. I mean, Charles Darwin never ran a controlled experiment in his life. Yeah. There's an open question. Was he a scientist? Sure. Even by the standards of the day, he wasn't a scientist. He was a philosopher. And for at least two of those guys, I, I know that they were, they suffered great pain in their life and, and loss. Dawkins was mistreated by an adult male when he was a young boy and Charles Darwin lost his daughter. And yeah. so in some sense, some people think his that, his, child, that 10 years uh, the origin of species was written as a form of a theodicy, as a form of justification of God and evil. That is, he's more of a, uh, the deistic understanding of God than the theistic understanding of God. That is he created it and then he stepped back kind of idea that he would have been more comfortable in that camp. And that was the beginning of his journey towards disbelief. So yeah. uh, I, I, agree I, I could you. go there in, in your own life. Can, can you tell us a little bit about your journey to faith? Were you, how, how did you come to faith? That sort of thing. I was raised in a very uh, liberal Christian denomination with a family that regularly went to church, but, I can't say we ever discussed anything. Um, I got out of high school and I literally knew nothing about the Bible, but I happened to go to Georgia Tech and I just happened to run into some Christians there. And my first week there, this one guy, he just grilled me. So Rob, why did Jesus die? I said, I don't know. And what does this mean in the Bible? I said, I have no idea. And these are, you know, basic Sunday school, Christianity 101 questions. I had no clue. Mm. And so through the influence of good, solid people, they challenged me on the Bible and I started reading it. And about maybe six months later, I had just had this giant epiphany. It's like, no, I actually believe this. Mm. And yet the evolution question was still hanging because as everyone else I knew at the time, I believe in evolution because that's science, I thought. Mm. And that, that took me several years to work through. I mean, it was a long 
uh, painful experience. By the time I got out of Georgia Tech, um, I no longer believe in evolution. And yet, next several years, I was really having a major crisis of faith. And so when I went to graduate school four years later, I didn't know what was true. I didn't know if the Bible was true. I didn't know yeah, if, if anything, really. And yet, within that first month, my graduate PhD level professors pretty much convinced me they had no arguments for evolution. Wow. And then I was volunteering at a youth group and the youth pastor got, um, he left and went to a different church and he asked me if I would come and start his college group. And I had no business being there, <laughs> but not knowing anything else I'm like, well, we got to do something. So we read through a case for Christ and we read through evidence that demands a verdict Mm. And things like that. And I think God studied me back into Christianity again. Mm. And here I am, I'm about 28 years old and I'm getting a, a foundational grounding because mm. what happened was, you know, I learned a lot about the Bible initially and then I ran into a bunch of liberal people right. that I couldn't answer in those questions. I never even thought of these things. I had no idea people even thought like that and they just slapped me silly. Mm. And then it took, years of reanalyzing their arguments to realize how fallacious the arguments were. Hmm. But at first they seem very powerful. So it's been a long and interesting journey. Well, I think some of the people who are going to watch this are going to watch this because number one, you work with creation ministries, international creation.com. Is that correct? Yes. And they're going to say, this is one of those religious fanatics who oh, believes yeah. that the earth is young and so the question, the question is, how did you come to the conclusion that the earth is of more recent origin than is commonly taught in science books? Well, it's a two-edged sword. Mm -hmm. One, the Bible says so. I tried every way you can imagine <laughs> to add millions of years to the creation account. I yeah. tried stretching out the days into long periods of time, not realizing that's called the day-age theory. Mm -hmm. I tried to add evolution to it until I realized that the order of events in creation week is completely contrary to evolutionary history. I tried everything, but you know, there's nothing in the Hebrew that indicates long periods of time there. There are a lot of ways to express long periods of time in Hebrew, mm -hmm. and none of them are used in Genesis 1. Mm. And so I realized that linguistically, I was in a box. Right. And then through the analysis of the science, and the understanding of the difference between operational and origin science, the understanding that naturalism is forced to conclude that the earth has to be very old because they only have slow and gradual and random processes. They don't expect things to happen quickly. So it has to be old. And then they went out and sought a bunch of evidences for it being old and skipped over all of the other evidences that point in the other direction. Mm. So scientifically it's actually equivocal. Mm. The earth could be as old as it is. God could have made the universe in as much time as he wanted. And when you look, you know, Look at the stars. There are some stars that are on the edge of exploding. There are some stars that are really big, some that are little, really small, maybe even some places where gases are squishing down to make a new star, maybe. But what would prevent God from doing that? Why would God create all the stars exactly the same? You know, this is his sandbox. He's playing around with us. Hey, he looks at the angels. Hey, angels, check out this star right here. It's about to blow up. I'm just going to let it go and put it in space. And a thousand years later, it's going to blow up because I can do that because it's really cool. And they sang in joy. And they sang in joy. Absolutely. And so there's nothing in the universe that demands billions or trillions of years or millions of years. Mm. It just is what it is. Yeah. I was saying naturalism as a science is really bad at origins. It's great in a laboratory. It's a wonderful laboratory science, but it is notoriously bad to explain where things came from. So we can't explain what started the Big Bang, what stopped the Big Bang, why it expanded that rate, why it expanded um, for that much time. We can't explain where uh, stars come from because balls, uh, clouds of gas in space disperse. They don't collapse. We can't explain where planets come from. We can't explain where biological molecules come from. We can't explain where life comes from. Mm. So since all of that is true, why am I trusting naturalism mm. as far as origins is concerned? Yeah. Yes. I, I'm not sure. I'm most scientists I speak with aren't big on philosophy of science, but uh, have you heard of the distinction between realism and anti-realism within philosophy of science? 
I understand it. I haven't yeah, spent yeah. much time digging realism into it. Is, but... Realism is basically describing, they say their theories describe the world as it is. Anti-realism is, says, our theories are good for making tests and predictions, but they don't necessarily describe the world as it is. And your your operational origin science kind of in a it kind of mirrors in some ways uh, a distinction that philosophers of science have used. I know a, a friend of mine wrote his PhD dissertation on the theory of evolution as anti-realist uh, Interesting. Uh, science. Yeah, so but it kind the of, older I get, though, the less I trust the conclusions of science. Hmm. The more I think that we are in a really delicate, untenable position. I wrote an article on creation.com called We Are Less Than Dust. And I explained that my body is 99.9999% empty space. Mm -hmm. The distance between the atoms in my body, if you made that the nucleus of an atom as big as our sun, the next atom nucleus would be 13 times farther away than Pluto is. Mm. And in between, there's nothing because electrons have no size. Yeah. So we are literally a vapor. We are literally nothing. We're an empty shell. The only thing you're, you're looking at is, elect, uh, is photons bouncing off an electrical shield that is surrounding all these tiny little dots we call nuclei. I'm, I'm literally hollow. Well, you, you and, don't look it. Well, I don't look it. I don't feel it. <laughs> But it's, it's almost like a matrix-like thing. You know, I'm just a, a projection, a hologram of something. Mm. Wait a minute, then. What's behind all that? Well, that's mm. the heavenly realms. It's yeah, the weirdness. Like, we, are, we are a physical reality inside something greater, and we don't see the greater. We see, you know, as Paul says, we see as but through a glass darkly. Mm. We have hardly a clue of what is on the other side of our puny little physical reality. You know, it's interesting because you're kind of mirroring also uh, traditional arguments for the existence of God. There's the uh, uh, horizontal cosmological argument like the Kalam, where they argue from beginning to a beginner. Uh, but there's also the vertical cosmological argument, which, which argues that God is necessary to maintain the existence of the universe moment mm -hmm. to moment. Uh, I and, with both. And, and so it would be... Uh, the universe would almost be like a projection that God or a television show that God keeps on until he turns the switch off and that, that it only exists because of his will and his power. And, and without him, there's no clockmaker uh, universe in that essence because God didn't start it and what and sat back and watch it. He's actually upholding moment to moment its existence. Yeah. So once again, you're, I you're agree with both of those. Yeah. Both uh, those I, 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 at the same time. As do I. It's interesting that your understanding of science marries into traditional arguments for the existence of God with, without you uh, consciously or, or verbally linking them. It's there. It's the same ideas coming through. Uh, John Sanford, the geneticist, wrote a book called uh, Genetic Entropy in which he presents the evidence that the genomes of all living creatures are degenerating. H have you read that book? Actually, I, I edited that book. So, yeah. So you read it more than once. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I corrected uh, grammar and went through it. Fine uh, tooth do, comb. Yeah. Do you agree with its findings? Uh, actually, it was one of the most amazing things I've ever read. Wow. I, as a trained PhD scientist, I realized that the guys in the upper echelons, mm. they don't tell everyone everything they're thinking. Mm. What they do is they grab some young guy and say, okay, son, come here. We're going to tell you the inside secrets. Mm. And those people become the proclaimers of the great Darwinian mindset. And yet they know their own weaknesses. They just don't ever vocalize them. Well, and that book yeah. was an insider's guide to evolutionary theory and what evolutionists are, are thinking and writing. And it was frankly amazing. In fact, uh, his yeah. illustration of the princess and the pea was one of the most brilliant things I've ever seen. Saying like, the princess is you. Your natural selection is operating on you. But between you and your genes are all these levels of complexity that separate the phenotype, the individual, yeah. from the genotype that natural selection has to act upon. Therefore, selection is blind, and it doesn't do what Darwinian evolution claims. Wow. So uh, could, could you cool. 
Could you, for the people who haven't read it, could you quickly give a kind of a ballpark summary of, of what the book's about and what, what best point <clears throat> makes in the book, you think? What stood out to you best? Okay. The title is Genetic Entropy. Entropy, as most people imagine it, is things fall apart over time. That's not really what the second law of thermodynamics is saying, but, you know, common way of explaining it, things fall apart over time. Okay. Well, that's true in genetics. Our DNA, like the background behind you, DNA is a very fragile molecule. You have in your body, every single one of your cells, about a million DNA breaks, mutations, oxidations every day that your cell has to fix or you die. So DNA is a very fragile molecule. And from one generation to the next, lots of mutations are passed on. Every child born has somewhere between... Eh, maybe on average about a hundred new mutations. It's a hundred spelling errors in your three billion letters that your parents weren't born with. Your parents have a hundred that your grandparents weren't born with. They had a hundred that their great grandparents weren't born with. So that's a major problem. Natural selection has to remove them or we will go extinct. That's mathematically certain. And yet natural selection can't remove them because most of them are so small in effect that they don't affect survival and they don't affect reproduction. And therefore, they just build up in the population over time. And so mathematically, philosophically, scientifically, extinction is guaranteed and Darwin was wrong. Wow. And that's the main thrust of that book and it is powerful. Genetic entropy so and the mystery if, of the genome. If you were to run a clock on that, on the rate of entropy, what, what kind of time frame would you look at for the origin of humanity based on this rate? Not, not on outside factors, just on this rate. For the origin of humanity or the future extinction of humanity? Uh, you can get both if you like. Okay. Let's go with the future extinction first because that's what, usually what people ask me. And the answer is, I don't know. Hmm. What happens is a species will decay and decay and decay and decay and decay and decay, and then the environment will change. Like a new pathogen will come in, a new competitor will come in, uh, some struggle, and all of a sudden, boom, and they do a nosedive and they just go extinct. Mm. So you can't predict extinction. Mm -hmm. The example I like to use is African cheetahs. There are only about 10,000 of them in the wild, and they're rapidly going extinct. Birth defects are increasing, litter size is decreasing, there's all these reproductive uh, incompatibilities. There's simply not enough of them. And they're literally breeding themselves out of existence. They will go extinct, but I don't know when. Mm. Something's going to happen to them and kaplamo, they're all going to disappear within a couple of generations. Going backwards, though, if you add up the number of mutations per year, you can actually use it as a rough clock to figure out where we started. Mm -hmm. But we have to factor in that God probably engineered into Adam and Eve a lot of genetic variability. Mm -hmm. So genetic variability isn't necessarily mutation. The Darwinists will say any variant is a mutation, but no, I say, wait a minute, this is intelligently designed differences that God put into there. So we have to separate out mutation from God design, and that's not necessarily easy to do because it's just letter differences. You don't know what's design and what's a mutation. But if you look at all the rare mutations, you can assume that most of the rare mutations are something that happened in human history since creation. Mm -hmm. Like I have mutations that no one else in the world has, except my kids. That's extremely rare. That's almost certain every letter that's unique to me was not an Adam and Eve. But letters that are me and you and in our listening audience, almost all those are probably in Adam and Eve. Mm. So if you split that, there's about 10 million letters mm. that like an A here and a T here, a G here and a C here that all people around the world share. That's probably created diversity. There's another 10 million or more rare mutations. Those are probably things that came about after creation. And if you look at the number of those we have to count for, how many generations you have and how many happen per generation, you're talking about a few thousand years of human history. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take that long to explain all the diversity in people. So, so you're saying it fits within a biblical timeline yeah. of creation to now. Yeah. Uh, the uh, mitochondrial genome, 
the little piece of DNA you only get from your mother, they pick up a mutation about every other generation, which mm -hmm. means you can look at all the mitochondria in the world and build a family tree, figure out how far people, how far apart people are. And at one mutation every other generation, Eve, the one female that led to everyone alive today, it was only a few thousand years ago. Wow. The Y chromosome is a little more different. There is more mutations than the Y chromosome. And it probably picks up about one mutation per generation. But when you look at it, you can see a family tree where one man has twice as many mutations as his cousin. But if that's true, then there's no, there's no molecular clock. Mm -hmm. You can't necessarily say X number of mutations equals X number of years. You and if some people pick out. up more mutations than others in the same amount of time, yeah. we're still in the right ballpark. About you know 250-ish mutations separate most men in the world. Okay, there's been about 150 to 200 generations in all of world history. There you go. So we're in the right ballpark. It's not, it's not like we're like, oh, no, we're a thousand times off. So, yeah, you can't just use a uh, this many mutations equal this many years uh, linear yeah, can't do that. scale. If you read the standard textbooks, they're going to say that our DNA comes from a common ancestor with the apes, uh, and therefore our DNA indicates that we came from an <laughs> ape-like ancestor. Does it? Um, no, but it <laughs> does indicate that we're more similar to apes than any other species. That's con that's you can see that. Yeah, I mean, look look at a rutabaga and look at a chimpanzee. Mm. What's more similar to human? Well, chimpanzee is. So on the outside, if we're similar, what about all the uh, control mechanisms on the inside? Would you expect maybe the genetics are similar between humans and chimpanzees? Yeah, you would. So both the evolutionists and the creationists are making the same prediction. Human and chimp DNA should be more similar than those two species are to any other species. Now there's an argument, maybe we're more similar to gorillas or more, maybe, maybe we're more similar to orangutans whatever we didn't necessarily know before we collected all the information but we're definitely more similar to those things than we are to um you know regular monkeys and we're similar to all the apes than we are than we are to mice and whales and we're similar to all the animals than we are to you know protists or fungi and we're similar more similar to those things than we are to bacteria and it's true genetically also. It's like this hierarchy that God created. So it is completely not surprising that human and chimp, chimp, human and chimp DNA are similar. It's interesting because I actually looked up the commonality, not just with chimps, which they claim is about 98%, but obviously it's a little bit lower than that. Yeah, they used but, to claim that, yes. Yeah, they used to claim that. Uh, ca uh, w one scientific website <laughs> says that we have 80% DNA in common with cows that we have 60% uh, DNA in common with fruit flies, uh, that we have 50% DNA common with banana. So mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure I didn't, I don't feel like there's a lot of banana in me, but I, I can't tell you what I had for dinner last night. And but human, there are some things that yeah. all life forms share, yeah. like the production of ATP, um, the electron transport chain. Mm -hmm. There's some you know, biochemistry that all living things have. And therefore, those genes are in us and in them also. So how, and they're similar. How, yeah. Well, how do, you, how do you discern between common design, which is what obviously most Christians would do, uh, believe in, versus a common descent? How, is there a way that you can look at it and see a difference? Or is it, an, is it part of the worldview lens that you look through? How do you see the difference? Honestly, I've struggled with this a lot. And in the end, I'm not sure I can figure out a scientific way to tell the difference, except in mathematics. Mm. And, we'll, and we'll so be, uh... we argue it the other way around. Mm. We take genetic entropy idea. We, um, in fact, Sanford and colleagues have uh, developed a massive computer program. It's called Mendel's Accountant. Mm -hmm. It's the most sophisticated evolutionary modeling program anyone's ever written. It runs on mainframes. I mean, it's a massive program, and you can take – any population size you want, any mutation rate you want, um, et cetera, et cetera. All these parameters you can put into this, this artificial population. And you say, okay, now let's apply natural selection to it. How long would it take to do X? Mm -hmm. And they have shown time and time and time and time again, with any realistic set of parameters, evolution doesn't work. And mm -hmm. so if you know, there's 35 million 
single letter differences between the human genome and the chimpanzee genome. 35 million letter differences, but they only have 6 million years. But evolution is not measured in years, it's measured in generations. Hmm. And chimpanzees in the wild, their generation time is, is like 27 years. Modern humans is 30 years. So divide 6 million by, let's say, 30, you've got 200,000 generations to produce 35 million letter differences that all humans have or all chimpanzees have. It's not like some humans or some, all of us. The amount of mutations that would take every generation is phenomenal because it takes forever for one mutation to spread out throughout the entire population. Mm -hmm. Even in the small, like, let's say that one of my mutations is going to be in every single human in the future. Well, we can model how long that would take. It would take millions of years. They don't have enough time to account for the differences in even their evolutionary time frame because of the mathematics. Hmm. So that's how I argue it. Both of us are, are predicting similarity. And when you look at the differences, they could be designed or they could be evolved. Yeah. I mean, how do you tell the difference? And so we just apply logic and mathematics and we say, look at this, your math doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Evolution is dead on arrival. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yesterday I was talking to Michael Behe and let's just say he would agree with you on the uh, evolution can't produce uh, the subsystems within the cells. Uh, yeah, his, a lot of his work is genius. Oh, absolutely. I was very, very excited that, that he agreed to let me interview him yesterday. That's really cool. For the students in my class and also for the audience who doesn't know, what is DNA? We've been talking about it. What, what is it? Um, it is a long, fragile, sticky molecule. It's made of sugar mm -hmm. and phosphorus and something called, um, well, a base. Mm -hmm. So four chemicals, adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thiamine. That's your A, C, G, T. And the A, C's, and G's, and T's are stuck together. Mm -hmm. And then there's a, a sugar phosphate backbone. And linking the backbone are your A, C's, G's, and T's. And it just so happens that, that uh, a G, your A6 to C, and G6 to T. Because one has... Two of these things have two places where they bond and the others have three places where they bond. So they don't bond this way. They only bond in pairs. Mm -hmm. I can get to a whole lot more detail. I'm probably no, I, don't say, I don't think we need to is, go into but, too much. Okay. The bonds between them, is that a, a, like a covalent bond or is it something weaker? It's, it's just a hydrogen bond. So it, it can be separated easily. Yeah, you can, you can warm up DNA mm -hmm. and, and as it gets warmer, the two strands will just float apart. Okay, so and, that, and that's necessary then as part of the uh, gene expression or, or uh, making proteins, that sort of idea. Yeah, the, the way the system works is if you're looking for a, a gene, if you want to make a protein, you start at a specific spot in the DNA, you unzip the DNA, and you read one side of it mm -hmm. in a certain direction. And that those letters are spelling out, okay, this amino acid, the next amino acid, the next amino acid, the next amino acid in a line that becomes the future protein. Mm. It's a really cool system. The origin of life study, and I, I did a little bit of research on this and uh, where you can see where they're uh, attempting to find the origin of life, uh, abiogenesis, chemical evolution from a naturalistic perspective. I didn't get... I got a lot of could have beens. I didn't get a lot of most likely was or had to have beens. I, I didn't see, I, I saw a lot of hand waving. How does the secular world believe DNA could have even originated? There's a, a, um, a book and a documentary that CMI produced. It was actually, it was my idea and I'm very happy about it. With three years of my life went into this. Wow. It's called Evolution's Achilles Heels. Oh, I've seen it on there. Okay. And in multiple areas of science, we identified what we thought were the Achilles heels of that area of science. And we have an entire chapter on the origin of life. And multiple things in the origin of life tell us that it's not going to happen. Using operational science, 
chemistry says no, probability says no, the physics says no, information theory says no. And there's all these problems that are not able to be overcome in a random chemical reaction. One is nucleotides don't form. You're not going to get your ACs, Gs, and Ts. Second is phosphate is a polar molecule that sticks to any divalent uh, 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 metal like a magnesium, anything with a plus two charge, phosphate sticks to it and makes an insoluble salt which mm -hmm. falls out of the water. So phosphate is incredibly hard to get. Um, bases you're not going to get. Sugars break down the presence of water. But even if you could get them, you're not going to be able to link them together into a long chain. Water is toxic for organic chemistry. Any organic, organic chemist will tell you they want to make a polymer of anything. Polymer of sugars, a, po a, a polymer of amino acids, polymer of nucleotides. The first thing you do is you have to get rid of the water. Because when you, when you chain up a bunch of sugars, yeah, they can stick together and make a, make a pro uh, sugar chain. But doing that, you have to lose the water. But if water in solution, the reverse reaction is faster than the forward reaction. So if you add sugar to water, you're going to get single sugars. You're not going to get chains of sugars. But even if you could, so what? Even if you could get long chains of sugars, long chains of amino acids, even if you get DNA forming, even if you could get nuclear membranes forming and, uh, or cellular membranes, and they're packaging up everything that is required in a cell into this initial primordial non-living blob with all the, all the toolkit on the inside, that's still not life because life requires information. Mm -hmm. Life is that, information. Life's is all that? about passing information from one generation to the next. So where do they propose that comes from? I'm not aware of any good proposal that's <laughs> even rationally serious. Well, and, there's uh, Francis Crick's directed panspermia. Oh, sure. All that does is, um, is push, you know, uh, yeah. was that push the buck? What, whatever that, uh, that, yeah, I was getting my metaphors mixed up. Um, <laughs> yeah. It just kicks the can down the road because then you have to ask the question, where did that life come from? So well, there's an infinite regress of aliens. Yeah, but they don't have infinite time. <laughs> and that is the problem. So uh, yes. you talk about information uh, stored in the, in the DNA by the, uh, the coding, the sequence of the backbone, the ACT and Gs. Uh, I can understand how that would work if you're trying to make a protein by unzipping and copying a section. But DNA also, clearly, if you're going to use DNA to start each living creature, it, it has to encode from beyond just making proteins. It also has to encode to tell the developing, the developing zygote to make some liver cells, some brain cells, bone cells. Those are different kinds of cells. Uh, where's that information? And also has to tell it, put an arm here and a leg there. Where's all that information in the DNA? Yeah, that you're, now you're talking about not the origin of life, but the origin of complex life. Right. Which is another hurdle. Yeah. But the origin of life is the biggest hurdle. Sure, sure. Complex life is really, really difficult. Tweaking something once it's around, like making the neck of a giraffe a little longer or a polar bear's fur white instead of brown, mm. that's trivial. And see, what Darwin did, he argued from the trivial, generalized it, and said, oh, I can explain everything. Uh, but that's the wrong way to argue. You've got to start with the difficult, figure that out, and then maybe you've got a case. Hmm. And so that's why the evolution of Achilles' heels, we drove all the way to what they could not answer. So answer that for us, and then maybe we'll start to believe you, but they can't. Yeah. So by the time you get theoretically on the evolutionary scale to humans, how much information are we talking about does it take to make a human? I mean, how much information uh, in understandable terms would be in a human genome? You can't even define what information necessarily is. Because yeah, there's 3 billion letters in the human genome, but part of the information content of the genome is that the order of letters affects the chemistry of the DNA, which causes a twist and bend in certain ways. So this gene might be over here and this gene might be over here, but you know what? They're brought right next to each other in 3D space because of the ordering of the letters. How do you figure out 3D information? I leave it to guys like you. 
<laughs> it's actually 4D information because the, the shape of the genome changes over time. Yeah. And that kind of information, it's, it's, not, it's, it's beyond us. It's complicated. Okay. Hey, let's go back to the, the origin of complexity sure. for a second. Sure, sure. Darwin did something very interesting. He was trying to explain the origin of the eye. Mm -hmm. And he said, start with a light sensitive spot. Now I can imagine that, you know, a shallow cup might form and then maybe it can bend around and then maybe a lens could form and every stage would be an improvement on the last stage. Okay. But what he said was, <clears throat> start with a miracle. Mm -hmm. Darwin, whoa, wait a second. Darwin, are you kidding me? A light sensitive spot? That's yeah. one of the, like the most chemically miraculous things in the universe. The fact that a molecule could grab a bowling ball called a photon and not be destroyed by it and hold, do a hot potato, hand it to another molecule, which hand it to another molecule, which hands it to another molecule. And then all those molecules together somehow very quickly are linked to a nerve. And that nerve can send a signal to a central processing unit that can detect a signal and just act upon the signal and say, oh, I know what the signal is. Light or the detection of light by biology is phenomenally amazing, completely contrary to you know, random chemistry. And you can't start there. You can't assume it's true. Hmm. And then say, oh, now I can bend the, the shape of the eye and do X, Y, and Z. Wow. Darwin's again, he's arguing from the top down without any understanding of what is at the bottom. When you look at what's at the bottom, all the evolutionary ideas fall apart because they can't be. Yeah, it sounds like irreducible complexity type idea with even with vision that you uh, would you have a nerve that that evolved first for receiving the information or did you have the receptor? Evolved? You have to have them all in place at once or else you don't have anything that functions. And, and your molecules have to do things like quantum electron tunneling and, you know, things in physics that we're only figuring out now or the whole system doesn't work. Sounds pretty easy. Yeah. Piece of cake. <laughs> I, I can see, we, we kind of got on this a little minute, minute ago, but I can see how uh, an omniscient, omnipotent God could program information into uh, DNA, but according to secular science, how do they have any, you, I think you've alluded to this before, do they have any conception of how information got in there? Because information itself is not physical. Generally what I hear is, Oh, we don't, you know, what are you talking about Carter information? We don't even use that word in biology. I'm like, yeah, that's right. You don't because yeah. you're trying to ignore it. Once you have information, yeah. you can tweak it. You can modify it. You can rearrange it. You can make a spelling mistake or an improvement. You can rearrange a sentence or a chapter or duplicate a word. You can do all sorts of things to change it once you have it. But that doesn't explain where it came from. Hmm. And so like, you know, Darwinian biology, yeah, things can be modified. Species do change. Okay. But that doesn't explain where the species came from. Hmm. And that's the grand deceit of Darwinism. It's a philosophical assumption that if I look at what I'm seeing now, I can explain where everything came from.